Hey, it's Brendan, and this is my second video in my series on the fundamentals of synthesis and sound design. And we're going to learn how to turn these sounds in our heads into real synthesizers we can use in our projects. Throughout this series, we're going to be using a synthesizer called Helm, which is cross-platform and free to use. I went over how to download it in the last video, and I've put a link to it in the description of this video in case you haven't downloaded it yet. Even though I really like Helm, and it's what we're going to be using throughout this course, uh, the fundamentals of what I'm teaching you can be used in any synthesizer, digital or analog. And uh, a lot of this is going to be useful for sound design in general, not even just synthesis. So with that out of the way, let's get into Helm. Now, in the last video, I mentioned that it can be pretty intimidating at first glance uh, looking at Helm, because there's all these different sections here, and if you're anything like me, you might feel like you have to understand all of them before you can make anything in it. But the fact of the matter is, you really don't have to know how to use a lot of these effects, or these modulation envelopes, or even the filter to get started making synths. What you do have to know is this section over here, which contains the oscillators, our mixer, and our amplitude envelope. And today we're going to go over the first of these, the oscillator, because it's really the basis of synthesis. I mean, the oscillator is what is at the start of our chain of making sounds. If you think of, uh, say, a physical instrument like a guitar, the oscillators are like the strings. You can't have any sound unless you have that basic thing set up. And choosing between different waveforms, these different shapes on the oscillators, are sort of like choosing between nylon strings or uh, steel strings on a guitar. They largely determine the sound that your instrument is going to have. And in fact, even better than thinking of them as different strings, I think it's useful to consider each of these different waveforms, these different shapes, as different instruments in their own right. And I'll play through some of them so you can hear the difference between them. You can hear already that just selecting one of these oscillators is going to have a huge uh, amount of control in what your overall sound is going to be. And we can think of them almost as different instruments in an orchestra. And when we select different oscillators to mix together, we're sort of forming an orchestra. We're synthesizing one final instrument made up of several different sounds, and the levels that we have between them determine what the overall character of that sound is going to be. You might be wondering why it is that these different waveforms have such different sounds, and the reason is a little bit complex. Uh, I've put a lit video in the description of this video uh, by Berkeley that will go over some of the science behind oscillation and how exactly these waveforms turn into sound, but suffice it to say that these different shapes have different tonal characteristics that are just the same as different instruments in the physical world have different tonal characteristics. The same note played on different instruments will have a different character to it. And the reason for that is that in addition to uh, the original note that's being played, let's say it's an A440, in a physical uh, instrument, there are always additional notes played on top of that at a lower volume called harmonics. And the different harmonics that are present, as well as what volume that they're at, largely determine the characteristic of different instruments. It's how you can tell apart an A played on a piano from an A played on a guitar. And waveforms are just the same. They have different amounts of harmonics and tones on top of that original fundamental tone. So if I play the A440 on a sine wave, I actually just get that note that I'm playing. There's no additional harmonics on top, it's only the note I'm playing. But if I go to, say, a triangle wave, there is going to be some texture on top, because there are harmonics, there are additional notes played at a much lower volume, in addition to that fundamental note. And the further in we get to this uh, set of waveforms, the more harmonics there are, and the higher 
Well, not necessarily the higher volume, but there's a different ratio between the fundamental note and those harmonics that are on top of it. And that's largely what changes uh, the different tonality of these different waveforms, is just the ratio between and the selection of harmonics that are on top of the sound. That's a lot of information, and I think I'd like to just take a breath before we move on to our next idea. Okay, so now that we basically get what the differences are, or that there are differences between the waveforms, I think it might be useful to just, as an exercise, take a minute and just play each of these waveforms. And think to yourself, or better yet, write down on a piece of paper what characteristics you associate which, with each of these waveforms. For me, the sine wave always sounds very mellow and very simple. I might describe it that way and put it down on a piece of paper. But if I go right next door to the triangle wave, I might say it reminds me a bit more of, say, a flute. Uh, it's still pretty mellow, but it does have a bit of almost breathiness to it. So I might write that down to describe it. And the reason that I think it's a good idea to write down descriptions of these different waveforms is that, A, you're more li likely to remember them and to be able to identify them if you're able to think of some characteristics that you associate with them. But also, if you have a sound in your head and you can describe it verbally, you can probably just say, I want a sound that's sort of harsh and buzzy. Well, you can think, oh, well, I always think that the sawtooth is sort of harsh and buzzy. Or maybe I'll even go even more noisy and I'll go to one of the pyramids. And it's worth mentioning that when you select a waveform over here, or when you hover over it with your mouse, you can see the name of it listed up in the top left corner here. So take a minute and just write down some things that each of these waveforms make you think of. I promise it'll come in handy later when you're trying to form a synth sound from scratch. Once you have all that written down, what we can do is we can start to mix some different oscillators together to make a synthesized sound. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this video that this uh, selection of the oscillator is going to be the start of our chain, where we're creating a sound. And everything we do after this is just going to sort of alter that key uh, starting sound in some way. And one of the main things that we can do is we can mix the oscillators together in that starting uh, block before we add all the effects and things onto it. So this to me is sort of like selecting different instruments in a band or an orchestra and deciding how loud you'd want different sections to be. So I might, for a particular piece, want it to be a bit more mellow. So I might say, well, I think a nice mellow sound might be a sine wave. But I also want it to have just a little bit of bite to it. So I might mix in, in my mixer section, a bit of oscillator 2, which I've set to a saw wave. Let's hear how that sounds. So now it's almost got um, a bit of a sort of brassy sound to it. It's not just the mellow sound of the sine, and it's not just the harsh reedy sound of the sawtooth. It's a mixture between the two. And if we wanted to make it even more complex, what we could do is add in this sub oscillator, which is largely similar to the oscillators above, except it's played in a lower register. It's about an octave down, or you can do two octaves down if you click on this little button. Right now it's set to a sawtooth, or it's set to a square wave, Let's hear how that sounds. And you might notice if we look at this oscilloscope up here, where we can actually view the waveform that we're synthesizing, the more that we uh, sort of mix in different waveforms, the larger effect it's going to have on the final waveform, the final synthesized form. Take a look at what happens when I mix in this sub a little bit higher. It's starting to look more and more like the square wave and less like the sine wave that we started with. 
Whatever is coming through the loudest is going to mostly shape the waveform, but in the end it's going to be a synthesis of all the different waveforms together that create the final sound. That's a lot of different information that we just went over in one uh, pretty short video. So take a minute and think about all that we've learned today. That different waveforms are like different instruments, and each of them has different unique characteristics that are based on the number of harmonics and the volume of those harmonics in relation to the fundamental tone. I think it's useful to give some characteristic uh, descriptions for each of these different waveforms, and I do recommend having it on a piece of paper nearby wherever you're working, so that if you have a sound in your mind, and you know it wants, you want it to sound a certain way, you can say what you want it to sound like, and then check to see what waveform might make sense for that. And a lot of times, we're going to be mixing different waveforms together to get unique sounds. And I'll be going to that, uh, into that a little bit more in depth as we're making real synths throughout the series. But just keep in mind that a lot of times the answer isn't just one waveform, but it's a mixture of a few different waveforms. And finally, we can add in uh, the sub to add a little bit of low end, and even we can add in some white noise, which is very useful for creating uh, a bit of a uh, grittier sound, or especially useful if you're making percussive sounds. But we'll get into that a little bit later in the series. For now, just explore the different waveform options you have, and in our next video, we'll learn about the amplitude envelope that will really take our synths to the next level.